Hey everyone, this is kind of a fun video. We're going to talk about some of the weird quirks of JavaScript. Uh, we'll dive into some of the internals, how things work behind the scenes. We'll look at the spec, talk about how numbers are stored. But first, I want to point out two developers whose work I drew upon heavily here. Uh, the first one is named Dennis Dovan. I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, he's a great developer. I assume I actually have know nothing about him, but I'm just being nice. Uh, but as you can see here, he has a repository called WTFJS. And it just includes tons of examples of odd, weird, unexpected things in JavaScript. And then the second developer, very well known, Kyle Simpson. Uh, he's written a bunch of books, gives a bunch of talks on weird JS. This book series called You Don't Know JS, I highly recommend you check it out. I quote him a couple times in this video. You can find the links to these two repositories in the description, as well as the link to my notes. All right, so this first one is a relic from the early days of JavaScript. In most browsers, you can write HTML comments in JavaScript, and they'll be treated as JavaScript comments. So here's an example. I wrote a string that deliberately contains keywords like break and in, and if I try and run it, it's completely ignored. And if I were to alter it ever so slightly by deleting one of those dashes, we get a syntax error. So why is this? Well, it has to do with the early days of JavaScript, very early, when some browsers did not recognize the script tag. They didn't know what JavaScript was, so they would just take this code and render it to the screen. So users would just see a bunch of code showing up because it wasn't treated as code. So what developers did is they wrapped their code in HTML comments like this, and in the old browsers that didn't know JavaScript, they would just treat this whole thing as commented out HTML and not display it. But in JavaScript, they changed the way the comment works a tiny little bit. So in HTML, this is opening and closing. In JavaScript, this is not a closing comment. So this is just a one-line comment. Anything after this on the same line is commented out. As you can see here, we don't get the console.log, even though it looks like the comment closes. So what they would do in JavaScript instead was this. And they would put this below the code that they wanted to hide from the browser and they would put this at the start and then have as much code as they needed in here. So HTML would ignore all of this. JavaScript would just ignore this line and this line, and we still get the console.log. Kind of interesting, maybe, I don't know. Next up, let's talk about white space. For the most part, spacing in JavaScript doesn't matter. This is horrendous code, and hopefully you would never write this, but it does work. I can declare a function like this with all these weird spacings and indentations and line breaks, and I can still call, say hi. But there are some weird cases where spacing matters. Here's one. There's a method called toFixed, which works on numbers. So let's make a variable called n, and we'll set it equal to 35. And if we call n.toFixed, you pass in a number of digits for after the decimal point. So we could do 10, but we'll just do one here. And that works if I use a variable. But it doesn't work if I do 35 dot two fixed of one. Invalid or unexpected token. But this is a number. It's kind of odd. But it does work if I add a space right there. Or any other spaces. Totally fine. The only time it's a problem is if this dot, if the period, goes right after the number. Even though that's how we always call number methods or any methods. And the reason is that JavaScript is getting confused because this is usually used on numbers with a decimal. So you would call it like this. And so there's usually a dot before the method dot. It's just kind of a weird, odd situation where if you were calling this on a whole number, you would need to add a space there. So speaking of spacing and oddities, it's now time to address one of the worst features in JavaScript, something called automatic semicolon insertion. So this is the subject of lots of great blog posts. I actually linked to one down at the bottom. So in JavaScript, the rules around semicolons are kind of odd. There are very strict rules in the spec about what needs to have semicolons after it. This is a the language they use in the spec. Certain statements must be terminated with semicolons. And then a little bit later, for convenience, however, such semicolons may be omitted from the source text in certain situations. So to summarize, certain statements must have a semicolon after them always. But if you leave it off, JavaScript is going to try and help you and add them back in for you automatically. For example, something like this, if you have a variable declaration, the spec says there must be a semicolon there, but I didn't put one there and it still works. 
And for the most part, you can get away with no semicolons and you usually won't run into issues. But here's an example of where it matters. In this scenario, it doesn't work the way we want it to. So it's a very silly function called do thing. It takes a color and it returns an object where we have fave color set to, in our case, purple. So I execute it and what do I get? Undefined. So why is do thing undefined? Well, JavaScript is automatically inserting semicolons, not really where I want them to be. It's putting one right here. The rules say that the return statement has to have a semicolon after it, and I didn't include one, so it decides to automatically insert one here, so we end up returning undefined. But if we had simply done this here, and then I could just space it out however I wanted, this will now work. Because now, even without the semicolons, JavaScript is able to figure out that the semicolon should not go here because we're returning something, an object. Where does the object end? And so it puts a semicolon there. So this is definitely an annoying feature in JavaScript, and uh, it's why you should just always put semicolons where they need to go, learn the rules about it. You can find them in the spec. Next up, let's talk about some comparison weirdness. At some point in every JavaScript developer's early education, somebody tells them, never use double equals, always use triple equals, and that's generally a good idea. Double equals is weird. Now, the rules that it follows are very explicit, they're very strict, and it's, it's laid out clearly how it should work. It's just sometimes surprising. So as a simple example, let's take a value like two. Two is a truthy value. If we double not it, it turns true. So if the opposite is false, that means that two is truthy. So a lot of people think that means if you use double equals, two is going to double equal true because people think that we're testing if two is truthy, comparing that to true, but that's not actually how it works. The rules specify something different. So let's step through it for another example. If we have an empty array, an empty array is also truthy. It's an object and all objects in JavaScript are supposed to be truthy, except I'll show you an exception after this. Uh, the opposite is false, double not is truthy. So then why is this true? How is one thing equal to the exact opposite, or what we think is the exact opposite? Well, unfortunately, that's not how it works. So let's step through the abstract equality operator, AKA double equals. This is from the spec. So it talks about X and Y, where X is the left, Y is the right. So in our situation, this is an object. And what is this? Well, this is going to evaluate first. And we just saw that not empty array is false. So we're comparing empty array to false. So what do the rules say about this? Is type X the same as type Y? Nope, skip all of that. Null, undefined, no, number. So basically we go down to number seven right here. If type of Y is Boolean, return the result of the comparison X equals equals to number Y. Okay, so the steps were so far, we have this and that right side evaluates to false. So we end up with empty array, double equals false. And then we just hit this rule number seven that says return the result of the comparison x equals two number of y. So x equals two number of y. Well, there is no two number method or function that we can call on our own. But if we go to the actual spec, let's click on two number. It's defined here how it should work. It's called an abstract operation. And if we go to Boolean, which is the argument type, the result is positive zero, we'll come back to that, if the argument is false. So we passed in false, so that means we're now working with this. Empty array, double equals zero. So then we look through the rules again. What works this time? We have to go all the way to the bottom where it says, if type of x is an object, empty array is an object, and type of y is either string or number, we're now going to try two primitive of x, double equals y. So what is two primitive? This one's a little more annoying to explain. It's another abstract operation in the spec, but it's not as clear cut. If we look at two primitive, what you'll see is that if you pass in an object, it returns a default value for the object. Well, how is that default value determined? Well, usually a hint is passed in. It's really annoying to try and explain, but here it says, when the internal method is called with no hint, then it behaves as if the hint were number, unless the object is a date object, in which case it behaves as if it were a string. So two primitive called on an empty array behaves as if the hint was number, which means it's going to try and convert 
empty array to a number, and the result of that is zero. And then we end up with zero double equals zero, which gives us true, ta-da. So it's very weird, counterintuitive, but it's all by the rules. This is all exactly how it should work. It's not a buggy oddity. It's doing exactly what it should. So sticking with comparisons, but this time with the strict equality operator, triple equals, let's talk about not a number. So this is something that I've seen a lot of students get confused about. Why is not a number not equal to not a number? Isn't this the same value? And the explanation is kind of interesting. First of all, the reason this happens is based on the spec. In the spec for triple equals, it says, if X is not a number, return false. If Y is not a number, return false. So there's a special carve out for not a number. Why is that? Well, we have to talk briefly about floating point numbers, how JavaScript stores its numbers. It follows something called the IEE standard for binary floating point arithmetic. But the interesting thing is it differs from that standard in one place. This IEE standard says that there should be nine bajillion, whatever number this is, distinct not a number values. And in JavaScript, there is one not a number value. They're represented in ECMAScript, at least, as a single not a number value. So then the question becomes, why on earth would this standard, IEEE, -E -E, why would it have so many not a number values? Well, here's a quick crash course on how floating point numbers are stored according to that spec. Every not a number value follows this pattern. So everything you see here is either a zero or a one. And for not a number, there's a sign at the beginning, a zero or one, positive or negative. And then we have this part, which is called the exponent field. It has to be all ones in order for the value to be not a number. And then there's this massive chunk called the mantissa that can be any combination of ones and zeros, except all zeros. If it's all zeros, we're now representing infinity. So there's this massive empty area. It's not going to be empty, but it's up in the air. It could have any value in here, or almost any value of ones and zeros, and it would still mean not a number. So what do we do with this chunk? It's kind of an interesting story. One of the designers of the IEEE standard, William Cahan, Cahan, I don't know, he wrote in his personal lecture notes that the idea behind it was that those bits could store information about where the not a number came from, how, how we arrived at not a number because there's a bunch of different ways to get to not a number and that it would be useful to store that information there. But JavaScript doesn't do that. Most languages don't. But I did fall down a bit of a rabbit hole and I found this old listserv online where somebody was talking about a proprietary system they came up with where they could store information and data in this not a number mantissa and that they had patented it, but they didn't want to talk about it because they were starting a business with this idea. So it's interesting, but the point is the spec for how floating numbers should work says that there's a ton of different options for not a number, this many different values. However, ECMAScript differs from that and says, we're just going to implement one value. And that's why we have this. This rule says, if you have not a number and you're comparing it to not a number, they are 100% different every time even if they're not actually different to the language itself. Next, just a quick thing. Uh, not everybody knows this. There is a positive and negative zero in JavaScript. And this has to do with what we just saw up here. Every number in JavaScript follows this pattern, not necessarily with the ones here that specifies not a number, but every number is a sequence of ones and zeros. And that first digit is the sign. So zero is stored like this, positive zero, and negative zero is stored like this. So if we tried to do some math, like five times zero, we get positive zero. Five times negative zero, we get negative zero. But what's interesting, again, is if you try to triple equals zero and negative zero, it's true. Even though we just saw they are definitely different values. We got a different outcome. Once again, it is in the spec. It says, if you're triple equaling positive zero and negative zero, always return true. And lastly, let's talk about this odd case of document.all. So the standard for JavaScript or for ECMAScript says all objects are considered truthy, but there is this weird exception for this one object, document.all, which is an array-like object. It contains a bunch of nodes on the DOM, every node on the DOM. Before methods like document.getElementById were around, people would use document.all. If I test it out, document.all, 
this is what I get, this array-like collection. And it is definitely an object if I call document at all instance of object, I do get true. So it should be truthy. But if I call type of document at all, why do I get undefined? If I do document at all double equals undefined, that's true. And it double equals null. According to the basic rules in the standard, it should not behave this way. But there is another weird exception. And the reason for this is that back in the day, a lot of people would write code like this. If document dot all, and this would target browsers that did not have the DOM or had some weird legacy version of the DOM. I actually can't find much information about it, but generally it was used to test for old versions of Internet Explorer. So if document at all was not a thing, then this code would not run because this would be undefined. But then browsers like Internet Explorer leveled up and got better. And there was a problem because there was all this legacy code and they didn't want people to be able to do this anymore. But they also didn't want to stop supporting all these old websites and just legacy code bases. So what they did was make a really weird exception. This is how Kyle Simpson puts it. He says, so we can't remove document at all completely, but Internet Explorer doesn't want this document at all code to work anymore so that users in modern IE get new standards compliant code. What should we do? I've got it. Let's bastardize the JS type system and pretend that document at all is falsy. And that's what they did. Document at all is in the spec as a falsy value, even though just before that it says all objects are truthy. Anyway, uh, there's a lot more to talk about, but I'm going to end it here. Hopefully you found some of that interesting. It's kind of fun stuff. Maybe you learned something about not a number or how comparisons work in JavaScript. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching.